प्लीज डू दैट प्लीज डू दैट प्रिंसिपल फॉर टेन इयर्स he has written a very beautiful book which i uh, had a chance to read krishmuti preparing to leave because scott was very close to krishji for those 8 months the last 8 months of his life and he done a wonderful job editing the book which is memoirs of mary zimbalist in the presence of krishmuti many of us have read it in installments it's a beautiful memoir with these words Uh, I'll also add that Scott moved to uh, US in 1995, and he had did his PhD from Oxford on education. Uh, he he currently in US heading an organization called Holistic Education Incorporated. He is the executive director of that organization. With these words, I'll request Scott now to take over the stage and begin his talk. Scott, the format is that the speaker can talk up to uh, up to a maximum 1 hour and there's no minimum time limit so you can you can stop any time you feel like but at least uh, 50 to 60 minutes after that we'll request dr gajanan rao to make some observations and i have a few questions because you have been very close to krish ji so i have some questions about krish ji not on his teachings and then the floor is open for participants to ask questions so uh, this is the way it is please uh, is scott forbes amma amma i once again welcome him to begin his talk is scott that was the by mistake pin there thank you so i um i said that i would talk about what i understand to be krishna ji's approach to education versus interpreting krishna ji's approach to education because we all know how krishna ji was about interpreters um so anything i say that is nonsensical uh you can blame me not krishna ji um i'm just giving you what i understand fundamentally one of the things that's very different about krishna ji's approach to education is that he saw all of the adults in the schools as educators even if they just worked at, uh, in the garden but they all anyone who has contact with students um is an educator and i feel he also made a distinction between teaching and learning as people who are go into education we all are very keen on teaching but in fact you could be taught the most brilliant uh lesson in chinese but if you don't understand chinese you will learn nothing and what is important is learning for krishna ji and he also felt and he said several times um in several different places that his intention in the schools was the same as his intentions in his talks and gatherings so i'm going to look at all of what Krish, what i understand krishna ji said about education by trying to answer three questions and i have made an argument elsewhere that if you can answer these three questions about any approach to education then you can place that approach within the entire field of pedagogy so these three questions are what is the goal of that education not the stated goal you know you get if you get school brochures it's all about being uh, you know a, a good citizen or a wonderful person but where do they put their resources where do they put their time where do they put their money where do they put their personnel where do they put their space so what really is the goal of that education 
The second question is, what is seen as needing to be learned or acquired in order to achieve that goal? And the third question is, what is seen as causing or facilitating that needed learning? Now, it's very difficult to talk about causing the learning for Christian G because that becomes very mechanical. And yes, you can cause certain things of learning math or learning grammar or learning actor acting or, but the real learning Christian G cared about had no cause, but it could be facilitated. So to start these questions, can everyone hear me? Yes, we can, yes. Okay. So the goal for Christian G of education, he states emphatically, but ambiguously. He said that it was for flowering and goodness. He said it was to awaken intelligence, to help people learn to lead a religious life. And he talked about people becoming completely free. Now, all of these things are, he was very emphatic about, but what exactly do they mean? And that we get into a lot of difficulty with. But one of the things that's very clear is that all of these goals that Krishnaji had are kind of immeasurable and they are subjective, they're subject to interpretation by people. And of course, all of our approaches to education in the West, and now I know uh, in India, we are addicted to measurement. We are addicted to what I call evaluation rather than assessment. You can't have education without assessment. You have to know that a student doesn't know this, and then you work with them and you do something, and then afterwards you can see that the student does know that. So assessment is essential, but when we start adding values, evaluation, when we start saying, this is a 70, no, that's a 60, this is an A, that's a C. When you start adding, it's a bit like all the judging for, you know, the Olympic figure skating, you know, people hold up signs, it was a seven or an eight. Well, on what basis, you know, well, they have their own criteria, but it's all it seems a bit foolishness to me. Anyway, so Krishnaji's approach to education means that we can't be enslaved to evaluation. Now, what kind of things did Krishnaji feel had to be learned in order to achieve his goals? Well, even to look at this, we have to start looking at different kinds of knowledge. And I want to give you an example here. Um, in American universities today, you can take lots of courses on love. You can take courses on the um, neurophysiology of love, you know, what happens inside the brain. You can take courses on the sociology of love. Um, you can take courses on the anthropology of love. You can take courses on the history of love. You know, was love in you know medieval French chivalric courts as love at Woodstock in 1969? I don't think so. Um, you have all kinds of. Uh, things about love, that, but so a person can take all of those courses and get 100% A's on all of them, but never have loved. Let's call that knowledge A. Person B cannot have taken any courses at all that have loved deeply. 
so it's a different kind of knowledge. And of course, the kind of knowledge that Krishnaji cared about was B. Um, and it's been talked about by in philosophy for a couple hundred years and in social sciences since at least the 60s, this different, these different kinds of, of knowledge. Um, a lot of them talked about, at least the first ones like Rousseau talked about representational knowledge. You know, to learn, to learn about an area from uh, reading a map or to learn about an area from walking around. So for instance, the cabbies in London, they have something called the knowledge. Um, if you wanna be a cabbie in London, you spend, I don't know how long, years uh, riding a bike from different points that they give you to uh, destinations that they give other get destinations. And so they spend years going around on a bike. They know everything from having gone on it in the rain and terrible weather and terrible traffic. Um, and when they've gotten a certain ability, then they're allowed to take the test to be a cabbie. So that's the knowledge. Um, but we have, and Christian G acknowledged that both experiential knowledge and representational knowledge are important. Um, I mean, you can't learn how to ride a bicycle through reading about it um, and even studying how, you know, how fast you have to go to keep your balance or how far you tilt to go around corners. Um, you have to actually ride a bicycle. But if you want to, if you want to know how far the earth, the moon is from the earth, you can't pace it out. You know, you actually have to go through representations of, of math and, and physics. So I can also remember just again to talk about this difference. An Indian student that we had at, at, at Brockwood and Harsh, you undoubtedly uh, remember her. She was Indian. She went very, became very interested in ecology, went to university, came back to India to do her university degree in ecology. And she told me that she never, the class never went outdoors. They never even had house plants. So here was a four year degree or three years, whatever it is, in ecology. And there was, and it was all done through representations. So that is valuing one kind of knowledge, which is not the kind of knowledge that Krishnaji uh, talked about. Um, so what are the elements of this, you know, flowering in goodness, awakening intelligence, uh, you know, leading a religious life? Can we say anything about what that knowledge might look like or what it might contain or what elements might be in it. And I think that we can. I think that we have to use Krishiji's language lightly um, and also use different language so that it's, it's, we're not just falling into dogma and into slogans and cliches. And I would say that these different elements um, that he talked about are distinct but they are not separate. Uh, and that's, they're all interrelated and part of a whole. So one of them was students knowing how to use their capacities. And that's part of knowing yourself. Um, how do, use your body for physical things, how to use your voice, how to use your, etc. So how to use your capacities. Um, a second element would be actualizing goodness. Um, and again, goodness is, without it being defined, it becomes a difficult concept, but we all kind of know what it means. Um, and We all can oh. develop kindness. You really press anything from you? And compassion. Um, so he also talked about, and I would say this is a third element, developing right action. 
And this involves developing good judgment, which involves seeing things clearly. And it involves seeing our conditioning. And it involves lack of self-centeredness. All of this is part of knowing oneself. A fourth element that I would say is part of Krishna Ji's, the knowledge that he promotes is the ability to be free. Again, deconditioning, but also freedom from conflict and freedom from authority. Um, fifth, and he did talk rather a lot about this, was discovering and refining values, not accepting the values of others. Um, and of course, this puts us in education in a very uh, difficult position because we want to impart our values to the students or the values we think are right or good. Um, but a student has to, in a way, discover and come upon the values that they are, if they're going to have this knowledge that I feel Krishnaji is talking about. Um, a little, a, a quote I have here is, freedom is the total denial of social morality and values and is the first movement of meditation. Uh, that comes from the only revolution, incidentally. Another element is meta-learning. Uh, the student has to learn how they learn. Um, and again, that's part of knowing oneself. Another um, element is right relationship, which is love and compassion, but it's also social ability, not sociability, but so, uh, what I'd call social ability, uh, which is the ability to be in different social settings and operate fluently, operate effectively. Another element that Krishnaji talked about was sensitivity, which involves the ability to see and the ability to listen. A ninth element that I've distilled is seeing thought as it occurs. Again, part of knowing oneself, but Seeing thought as it occurs, seeing hate, seeing fear, seeing all these things as they occur. A quote that I keep above my computer here, um, which is because it's one of my favorite quotes. I actually took this off of the wall of Mary Zimblist. She also had this above her computer. There is no self to understand but only the thought that creates the self. So seeing this thought of the self as it occurs, um, David Bohm had this, um, I thought quite brilliant uh, insight in expressing what Krishnaji was saying. He talked about the fact that we all have uh, proprioception. In other words, I don't have to see that I'm holding two hand, two fingers up behind my back. My, I have the ability, my nerves go through my body into my arm, into my brain, and they, and they tell me that I'm holding two fingers up or I'm making a fist or I'm pointing my thumb down. Um, and, and David said, used to say that this is, we've developed this these prefrontal lobes, um, cerebral cortex, so recently in history, like a couple hundred thousand years. And we have no idea what it's doing. We don't see thought as it occurs. And that the next large shift for humanity will occur when we have a kind of a proprioception of thought, I call it. I call it in some of my writing, cagioception, because um, I think 
it's an important thing and it's something for us to, to, to look at. Um, a tenth element which I have put down is an openness to the other. Um, this is difficult, but it does have to do with a sense of oneness. It does have to do with selflessness. And it also has to do with allowing something else to act. Krishnaji would frequently say in his talks, um, just listen. Don't try and do it, just listen. And somehow the listening um, allows something else to act. Another element that I uh, feel is part of Krishnaji's needed knowledge is living aesthetically. The ability to see beauty and the ability to act gracefully. A 12th element I feel in this knowledge that Krishnaji promotes is indifference. Somehow not having the self attached to everything, not having the future attached to things, a kind of indifference, which is not indifference to the suffering of others, but a certain indifference to oneself. Krishnaji loved having fun. He loved joy. And he spoke about the importance of creativity. And part of what I was saying before about this letting something else act is how to take in the teachings, seeing the truth that is presented. Um, and this, um, I'll tell a little story here because I think it's important uh, in this regard. Any of us who were at Sanan, which was a very uh, multilingual uh, audience, saw that there were many people who didn't speak English. And I, I know that this happens in India as well. And they would come to the talks and they would just be, they had little bits of English and they would be enormously impacted. And someone was commenting on this to Krishnaji and he agreed. And this is a person who knew Krishnaji well. And this person said, I think that people are so impacted by what you say because you live what you say. And Krishnaji agreed. This person went on to say, I've listened to you for a long time. I feel I can say a lot of what you say, but I don't live it. So when I say these things that you say, are these things still true? And Krishnaji paused for a moment and he said, yes, they are still true, but they have no truth in them. And that ability to distinguish when there is truth in something seems important. It also, of course, should make us very skeptical of all the people who want to tell other people what Krishnaji said. Because in fact, 
they're not saying what Krishnaji said. Or they are in the sense of a robot, you know, could say the truth is pathless land, or you know, <laughs> you are the world and the world is you. But it's it's got it's just words. And what Krishnaji really said was truth. The final element that I feel I've distilled um, from Krishnaji's work on education is the ability to be silent. He felt this was important enough that he actually um, encouraged all of us at Brockwood to begin all of our classes with a few moments of silence. We began our day all together with 10 minutes of silence. All of us who would get out of bed. Um, it was, silence was very important. And the ability to be silent, he talks about the richness in silence. So these are elements of the knowledge that I feel Krishnaji felt was needed in order to achieve his goals, the stated goals. So what can we say facilitates, not causes, the needed learning? And I would, I feel and I've, I feel that there's three categories of things. One is aspects of the students. A second thing is aspects of the staff. And the third thing is aspects of the place. Now let me begin with the students. What's interesting about the students and distinguishes them from the staff is that as far as I can see, all of the aspects of the students that facilitate the needed learning for Krishnaji are inherent. All of the aspects for the staff that facilitate the needed learning are acquired. So for the students, all students have inherent learning processes and they're dependent on the age, on the stage of development and they follow both general laws and particular laws. Violating either, violating the general laws uh, for learning processes or the particular laws causes wounds. The particulars of each student, of each child cannot be known beforehand. And the implications for teachers for this is that it's far more demanding. Um, the implications for students of fear and interest are very important for different stages of development. The second inherent quality of students is that as far as I can see, Krishnaji felt they all had inherent motivation. They want to learn. Children seem to want to learn from the moment they come out of the womb. Um, and they especially, and he, there seems to be a, a motivation towards goodness and intelligence that is natural. And students are motivated when they see themselves progress. You see, at least in America, I see kids spending thousands of hours learning to do tricks on skateboards. Um, just if they see themselves progressing slightly, it spurs them on and keeps them going. I, I wish you know they had that kind of dedication to my lessons, uh, learning my lessons when I was teaching. Um, and this motivation, this natural motivation can be harnessed or hindered, nourished or violated. Secondary motivation is superfluous and even damaging. Um, there are several times that 
psychologists have tried to run an experiment and every time they've had to stop it and now their ethics won't allow them to continue to try it anymore. But they took students who were naturally motivated to do things like play the piano or paint or write poetry. And for these students, every time they did that, they, got, they gave them a little reward. They gave them a gold star. They gave them uh, you know, a good grade. They gave them praise. They gave them something. Um, and after a while, students started doing these things for the secondary motivation. And they stopped having an interest in doing these things on their own. So it ruined the music and painting and et cetera for these poetry for these students which is why it's now unethical to run those experiments again. Um, aspects of the staff, which facilitate the needed learning. And as I said, unlike students for staff, this has to be acquired, this has to be learned. It's not inherent. One is that they have to understand their, stu their students and their needs in general and in particular. Not all students are the same. I read a very interesting, um, and because it's in particular, you can't really predetermine what a student should learn or be. Um, there was, I read a very interesting paper, a uh, research paper about the origins of progressive education and um, why it came when it did in England and America. And um, this person with a certain amount of, of um, compelling evidence was saying that it was because of the emerging popularity of the idea of reincarnation before that, children were seen as empty vessels that needed to be filled, blank slates that you needed to write on. And suddenly, notions of reincarnation, which started to come in the middle 1800s in America, and possibly about that in, in England. Um, and the problem or the challenge of reincarnation is that people come with a certain background. They come with baggage. They come with things that they've learned. They come with perhaps a trajectory already to where their life should go. And this forced for these progressive educators who started all these famous progressive schools uh, in England and in America, um, and eventually in Germany, it, it forced them to stop the treating children as blank slates and empty vessels. Um, so aspects of the students, understanding students and their needs in general and in particular. And of course, what they have in part, their needs in particular can change uh, with development. Staff must also understand good pedagogic practices, which as far as I can see from Krishna G, mostly involves avoiding damage, avoiding fear, avoiding authority, avoiding wanting to be an example, which is very seductive for most teachers. Good practice also follows inherent learning processes of the students rather than leading it. It seems to accommodate student interest, which means that students must have an active role in determining the practice, which of course fosters the development of responsibility and freedom, etc. The second understanding that staff members must have is understanding good pedagogic relationships, which involve empathy and affection, never fear. Goethe, the famous uh, German philosopher, said that you only learn from those you love. 
And I think that's true. Security is needed, psychological and physical. And security is needed because all learning involves accepting that we don't know something. And accepting that you don't know something is really being vulnerable. Also understanding a good pedagogic relationship is understanding the power imbalance that exists between students and staff. It's the basis of all of our social life, but it's also understanding the power imbalance is a good introduction, introduction to social justice. One of the bugbears of my culture at the moment. And in this sense, context is content. I, that seems to come back and back in, in different ways in Krishnaji's teachings about education. That what's happening on the ground, what is going on between people is actually the lesson that's being given. Staff must present themselves honestly and authentically, not as an image. Again, this is very challenging. You stand up in front of a classroom, you're being judged, you want to project a good image and not necessarily be authentic. But again, context is content. If the teacher is not willing to be honest and authentic, then he's teaching dishonesty and inauthenticity. And some things can only be learned in the pedagogic relationship. I mean, affection can only be learned from an affectionate relationship. Questioning oneself and being open to change can be learned from relating to someone who is doing that. Again, context is content. And of course, that means that students have to, or that staff have to be committed to their own development because students really experience what staff are, not what they want to project themselves to be. So to give the student a taste for their own inner development, a staff member has to have a love of their own inner development. This differs dramatically from like a coach in a sports team who doesn't have to be an expert at, you know, you can have an excellent swimming coach who isn't actually particularly good at swimming, but they know everything about what it involves in swimming. What, that's, not, that's not what happens with the kind of knowledge that Christian G is talking about. The staff have to be doing what he's talking about, which is why I think I always felt at Brockwood that the school was as much for the staff as it was for the students, maybe even more so. Um, and of course, all of this comes down to the importance of being rather than the importance of doing. Now, aspects of the place that facilitate the needed learning one, the atmosphere. Krishnaji spent a lot of time talking about the atmosphere at Brockwood. He used to talk about the fact that there's a, there's a cattle grid that's at the base of our uh, driveway as you enter the property. And he used to say that people entering and crossing that cattle grid should feel something. So there has to be a kind of an atmosphere there all, it also has, there has to be safety. It has to be a place that's safe and safe from ridicule, safe from bullying, safe physically. It has to be safe. 
and it also has to be beautiful. You know, I, in the American schools that I went to as a boy, they had all this unbreakable furniture, unbreakable, you know, lights, et cetera, et cetera. So what, what is the thing that students want to do? They want to break them. You know, at, at Brockwood, we had lots of things that were delicate. We had antiques, we had, you know, and people took care of them. So that's important. Another thing is nature. Krishiji felt that there's things to learn in nature about ourselves and about others and about the sacred. So having as much nature as one can and respecting nature. And if it just means a house plant, that's all you can, well, they are fine, but everyone can take care of those house plants. And so to have nature around, and of course, you look at most of Krishnaji's schools um, and certainly all the ones I've visited, they are in enormously beautiful places in nature. And that wasn't just because the land was cheap, because <laughs> it often wasn't. Um, it's because nature itself, that aspect of the place is a fundamental part of an aspect, a fundamental part of the knowledge Krishnaji felt needed to be acquired. He also felt that the schools should be as student-centric as possible. Students should have agency, agency. They should care about the place and they should have some voice in how the place is run. So, those are my three answers, or my answers to Krishna, those three questions. What needs to be learned? Uh, what, no, what is the goal of education? What needs to be learned? And what facilitates the needed learning? So, I've spoken for 40 minutes which is, uh, I believe, what I was asked to do. Um, if there's any questions, I'd be glad to try and answer them. Thank you, Scott. Thank you so much. Very interesting discourse. Uh, before I take questions, may I request Dr. Gajanan Rao to make some observations? Sir, would you like to say something? Yeah. Unmute yourself. Yeah. No. Am I heard? Yes, you are. Yeah. Thank you very much personally and on behalf of everybody here, Mr. Scott. It was beautiful listening to you. It is like somewhat being in the days of Krishnaji to have Harsh and you and some others here, maybe you have been those years, like even Pariksar and Siddhartha, I don't know if you heard him. Um, uh, yes, he has heard him, I think. Even you, I take simple examples to say how each thing that uh, Mr. Scott said comes through him personally. That's why he sometimes said, Take from the horse's mouth as I am here alive. Tomorrow you will have only videos and audios to listen to. You know, he would come out of the car at Vasanta Vihar, which brought him from Rishi Valley. As he got down, the driver had already got down. First thing you do is turn around to the driver. Then the TVS car went and he would say namaskar <laughs> to him. Yes. Thanking him heartily. 
nothing was just physical for him. It included his whole mental faculty, whatever he said. Quite right. I did. And I'm only wanting to ask Scott today and others here are running schools, and I'm also running one. There isn't such a satisfaction that we are really doing something to the future world. As Krishnaji once said, a little disappointedly, do we have lines roaring out of these schools? He had a question. But there are our children who are out today as adults making difference, but having listened to him, having read him, having him as a role model for all schools, we ought to do much more, it looks to me, than what we are doing today. As Mr. Scott mentioned, the teachers who come to teach, it's not always you can get a very good teacher, particularly from the point of view of what Krishnamurti is saying to change the world. Yes. And as is it happening to anybody that one has completely undergone a change is another question. Which may be in the discussion, one of you will answer. In one man, probably after the Buddha, 2000 years or 2500 years, he said something very, very valuable to humanity. Maybe there are people who have undergone some change in them. And this change he is talking about is drastic, you know, fundamentally change when you are. It is like taking another genma, mutating all that you have put into your consciousness to be new, fresh. But it is not that one thinks it is impossible. One shouldn't think it's impossible. If someone has done it, another can do it. A very simple experiment, one of the discussions of Krishnaji, few rats learn to get off obstacles, you know, to get to a place where there are shocks given, they take different routes and get to the place where the food is. In India, one of those who was taking part in the discussion, a scientist, a natural scientist, I don't remember his name, Hyderabad. And after some time, he said, Rats in Australia tested through the same, uh, you know, obstacles. Did this much easier? Like somebody threw a Sputnik in part of the world out into the space, and so many countries did it. So the human consciousness seems to carry the elements of change to other people too. I really believe it. That's why it's maybe he said, "Give me five people." People looking to eternity, I'll change the world. Very serious about what he's saying. That seriousness will catch up. Even the schools, we somehow are shy to expose Krishna too much to the students. I do agree there's a point in it. But they ought to know what this world teacher was saying to the world and to the particular school too. And in terms of listening, can anybody beat him? In a 7,000 audience in Bombay, in that uh, arts college, I've seen him jerk when somebody sneezed far away as he was talking. His body was jerk. In fact, his ear was not so sensitive at times. You would ask what he's saying. But there's a question also of the language in India. Each one speaks different way, and he's not able to get that. Fortunately, I used to be sitting in the front in some of the lectures. I would interpret to him what he said. And also Narayan was doing it too. There was a man in the audience sitting in the gallery. It's a question and answer session in Bombay. He was talking all kinds of things. 
it looks to us, it looked to us. It was a question, you know, very long question. And uh, we all started in the meantime laughing because it thought uh, looking a bit bizarre and uh, Krishnaji at once shouted, Sir, please be quiet. That gentleman sees something. You never listen to him at all. So it really we were shocked because we couldn't hear him, we couldn't interpret him properly for ourselves. He asked that man to come and sit by his side and repeated every word that man said in his question. It was something startling. So listening is possible, as he always said, not with the physical ear. There's a mental ear, maybe every cell, the 15 trillion cells or so in the body has its own sensitivity. So when Mr. Scott says sensitivity, I think it means quite a lot. And to take it to children's schools is really a very great job. And, and our teachers are doing the best, I'm sure. But are we really doing the best is a question in me. And I also want to know, as general, and then I'll stop it. Um, of course, we, we want to listen. We want to change. I suppose it has an effect on others with you. You know, in, in, in a small house, five members, the head of the family is by nature kind, by nature affectionate, by nature very giving, as a giving quality, kindness, charitable. You will see most of the members of that family would be that. It's not, it's not just copying. The mental setup, you bring up children with a certain sensitivity, with a certain, you know, intelligence, uh, awakened, you know, if you could have. And uh, the whole, whole school will be that. And imagine their being introduced to society. There is a possibility of change. I don't take it. I don't say no. I am. My question is: Is the 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 the, the um, challenge itself is so great? Some of us may imagine we have got it, but if we haven't got it. He would point out. So there is no practicing. There is no training. Fundamentally, unless you change, negating all the previous load you have with you, I suppose this change you expect is almost impossible, but not really impossible. I would like some to either Harsh or Mr. Scott himself or somebody else who speaks. How can we make this teaching not Uh, emotions for another man to come to help us evolve. Should I, should I attempt to answer this? Have a revolution. Yes, sir. I think I have finished. You must say something. All right. So, is my um, question ever? I think that there's a couple of, of responses I would make that I feel that Krishnaji. I mean, we're all looking for the individual who has changed as Krishnaji uh, said we should. But in fact, um, I feel that the consciousness of humanity has been affected by Krishnaji. I'm, I'm quite certain about that. So um, I'm not looking for an individual. I think that that's the wrong place to look. I think looking at human consciousness is where we need to look. Um, I would also say that rather than trying to do so much of what we feel Krishnaji wanted us to do, even though that is important, um, 
we have to not do things that are damaging. And I feel that Western education and as it has been um, practiced in India also is fear driven. Parents are afraid their children aren't going to get ahead. Teachers are afraid they're going to lose their job. Uh, school principals are afraid they're going to lose tuition and going to lose their student body. There's, it's, it's entirely too fear driven. And that is something that we can all try and stop or avoid. Um, and I think that you'll find other things that we can stop and avoid. You know, I've I pointed out some of them. I think that we can try and show our teachers to stop trying to be an example, to stop trying to lead too often through ridicule. Um, there's all kinds of things that, that we can do to make the schools more in line with Krishnaji's intentions um, without worrying about whether they are completely fulfilling Krishnaji's intentions because that's just an idea anyway. Thank you, Scott. Thank you. Uh, I have a few questions, but uh, uh, Viji, yeah. one, one answer to him, one yes, question. Yes, with. yes, yes, Dr. Uh, probably, probably Mr. Scott thinks, Scott Forbes thinks that there is uh, uh, the, the Krishnaji's talks and um, his presence for 90 years has affected humanity's consciousness somewhat already. I think so, Mr. Scott, don't you? Yes. Yeah, and uh, more of it might make a more difference in the humanity we are. Perhaps. It's, it's difficult to know. Um, it's difficult to... It's difficult to know whether it works like chemistry, you know? A little bit yeah. of this chemical has that reaction. You put a little bit more, you get more of that reaction. I, I don't, I don't, I don't know. Thank you. I think yeah. uh, I have a few questions. They are basically on uh, Krishji, not on his teachings. But before I ask them, uh, Harshji has a question to Scott. So Harshji, please go ahead and ask your question. Unmute yourself. Okay, uh, and first let me say that uh, uh, Scott and I come from literally the same school of thought. And we have this <laughs> <laughs> yes, we do. <laughs> and we have discussed these questions between us. I was trying to count up the number of times with and without Krishnaji. Over yes. a thousand, maybe 2,000 times. Jesus, I, were, I think more than a million. <laughs> yes, we <laughs> constantly discuss this because we were looking, which is a challenge for everybody, how to take what Krishnamurti says, which is on, uh, abstract isn't the right word, it's seen from a great height, if you like, and to translate that into actual action in the schools, to a program that you're going to set up, or the, how the day is structured, or uh, and all of that, because all of that is part of producing that atmosphere in the place, the relationship between the staff, how to increase the relationship between staff and students. So, you know, to translate all of that into daily action in the school has been a concern of ours for many, many yeah. years. And I actually completely, and I'm complete agreement with the things that he says, but I would ask him something to elaborate on something which um, he hasn't mentioned so much, rather implicitly. And that is, you know, Krishnaji would say, question everything. The role of questioning and inquiry yes. and the yes. implication of that in the student, if possible. Yeah. Yes. Uh, it's fundamental and, and 
thank you, Harsh, for pointing that out because um, I should have I should have talked about that. Probably in the context of the aspects of the student of the of the teachers because they have to question things, and that invites students to question things. But questioning is is fundamental to what Krishnaji felt we should be doing not just in the schools, but in our lives. Thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll go to my three brief questions. They are basically about Krishji, not about his teachings. Uh, Scott, on 7 February 1986, just a few days before Krishji passed away, he dictated something on a tape where he mentions that there was this supreme intelligence that operated through his body. And he further said that his body was developed over a long period of time. And that one may not find another body like this for several hundred years. What do you make of this statement? <laughs> you know, partly, Partly what I make of it, um, I talk about in the book that I wrote about the last nine months of Krishnaji's life and his conversation with um, the pundit and what the pundit found. And it seems to, I can't comment on it. It's, it's so far above my pay grade, I can't say anything about it. Um, I think, and I, I, I give the, I give the whole, I asked Krishnaji about it on tape because I felt it had to be taped. Um, and so I give the transcript of that in, in the book. Um, I feel it's essential and it's just so extraordinary. I think also if you read the accounts of the process um, from Nietzsche, from Warrington, um, the process, and then from other people, you know, and the process kind of continued um, through Krishnaji's life. Uh, and it was witnessed by several people, Pupil and Nandini, uh, Mary Zimbalist, Vanda Scarvelli, um, and it, it was a very, very physiological thing. Now, it, it was also a very spiritual thing, I will grant, um, but I'm not in a position to judge that. But from the evidence that I can judge, um, it was very, very physiological, involved a lot of pain. Um, so in that sense, what other body has gone through that? I don't even know what other body could go through that. I, I've, I've got Nietzsche's account and I've read it carefully and Warrington's account and I don't even think my body could stand it. You know, <laughs> I think I would just disintegrate. So Yeah, what? We don't have another body like that. And I don't know what it means for another body like that to come about. As I say, this is absolutely, um, it's extraordinary. Have you, incidentally, have you, um, have you read Kishore's book? No, Mahesh, Mahesh. So Mahesh Kishore. Mahesh, he was known as Mahesh Saxena when he was no, the head no, of the I'm foundation. Not. No, I'm not. So he did he did an extraordinary study of Nitya, and the book is is entitled Nitya, A Tale of Two Brothers. Okay. And he did a 10-year study of everything that he could find in all the foundations and in the TS. He, he seems to have had more access to the TS archives than any one of us have ever had. 
Um, and physiologically, physically, never mind spiritually and psychologically, Krishna G was re really very singular. Okay, thank you, Scott. I have another question. I would, al I would also, I would also say this, if I may. Yeah, please. I don't know that we need another one. Okay. <laughs> it may be several hundred years before we get another one. We don't need one, maybe. Maybe if we paid attention to the one we had, it would be enough. Yes. yes. Uh, my second question is similar to the first one. There seems to have been a great mystery about Krishna, which perhaps nobody really understands. I would like to ask you whether in your interactions with him, you had a feeling that he was a great scholar or teacher, or was there something dimensionally different? Was he a divine? There was something absolutely dimensionally different. And um, while he gave lots of hints about that and one could sense something like that there's that one conversation that's quoted in my book where krishiji talks about him listening to the larger k well what's that But that's the only thing, and I had that recorded. Um, so I, you know, I feel that memory is a terribly, terribly flawed instrument. Um, and so I don't trust memory, not even my own, maybe even especially my own. Um, I've seen it make so many mistakes, but um, this is recorded. I'll come to my last question now. You know, Mark Lee was here this February when we were celebrating 125th birth anniversary of Krishna Ji in Rajghat. And uh, Mark mentioned that before Krishna Ji passed away, he said, I am ready to go. They are waiting for me. But the body has its own program. But Would the you what? The body has its own program. Would you tell us what does he really mean when he says they are waiting for me? You know, I mean, that is Mark Lee's memory. I have, um, I mean, I think I was always there when, when people were speaking with Krishna Ji, uh, or at least most of the time. Um, I have no memory of anything like that. I have no memory of him saying, they are waiting for me. I have no memory of they who aren't present, um, which doesn't mean there isn't a they that aren't present. But I, I, can't, I can't interpret what Krishiji said to Mark Lee. I, as I say, I, memory is a very dodgy proposition. Thank you, Mark. Thanks a lot. I'll leave the floor open now. Anybody who has a question, please just yeah, raise yeah. your hand. I'll, I'll unmute. Yeah. Dr. Yeah. Rao wants to say something. Yes, please. Just half a minute. Uh, she also had provided a certain answer to the question. She had to go through so much of a process, so many things that he went through to be what he was. Well, he also said it's not necessary for everybody. He said that not exactly these words. He also gave a, an example of uh, we don't require Thomas Alva Edison to come and switch on your lamp every time. <laughs> so maybe it's, uh, I don't know, Harsh is going to talk for it, or somebody else could. That's good so question, sir. It gives us hope. <laughs> May I ask you a question? Hello? Yes. 
uh, yeah. I think Savita ji has a question. Let her ask first. Uh, then you... Sir, okay. Scott, sir, yes. I just want to know where do I get this book uh, that says the nature of the tale of two brothers? Because I was just uh, getting it checked. I can't find it. Uh, no, you won't find it. <laughs> can we have a soft copy of it if you have, sir, please? please. You, can, you can only get them from me, I'm afraid. The foundation you, doesn't. The foundation I... doesn't doesn't sell. So if you go to shfpublications.com. H. S H. S H F publications.com. Okay. Let me just check that that's correct. Yes, please. H H F. Uh, Savita Holland France. Yes. Any other question? Yes, sir. Yes, question. please. Yeah, please so, go yeah, ahead. It's shfpublications.com. And I, unfortunately, and I, I, I really do apologize for this, but there's nothing I can do about it. Um, the, the costs of shipping are punishing. Um, and some people like Australia and England they they buy um, a box of ten books because that makes them um, that's the cheapest way to get them. So you've got to have ten people who want the book. But um, oh, I can't. I, I and it's just and I'm just char I just char what the post office charges. I can't do anything about it. Yeah, and the book the, I, the book that I was referring to is Nietzsche: A Tale of Two, Bo Two Brothers, Brothers by Mahesh Kishore. I that. So, but is there a way that we can get a soft copy and we can read over the net, you know, instead of actually getting the book? Because I don't understand what a soft copy is. Uh, a copy? Uh, I mean, I don't know. I'm not too net savvy. Yeah, something which is online and a PDF that we can read. Or like on Kindle, like an ebook. Yeah. Yeah, like an yeah. ebook or, or a PDF copy that we could read, you know, sir. I haven't done that yet. I haven't done that yet. And someday they should go. They should. They should be a Kindle. Sorry. There should be a Kindle version, but I haven't done that yet. Okay. Any Thank other you. question? Hello. Can I ask a question? Yes, Mr. Dini, go ahead. Uh, I have, uh, sir, I asked this question four or five people in this meeting. Uh, none of them has answered correctly. Uh, only except one lady. The question is, we have all failed conveying the young people, students, not to belong to a rotten society. I repeat, this group, this group may feel bored, but I'm very much concerned about young people. Not belong to rotten society. Maintain the flame of discontent. Let that discontent be initiative and creative energy. We have all failed to convey this to young people and students. Um, I, I, first of all, I can't see you. Is your camera on? Can you put your camera on, Mr. Ah, Dini? There. Uh, yes. So yes. I, I, I didn't understand your question. Will you repeat it slowly, please? Yeah. Can I repeat it? Yes. Uh, this uh, question asked in this group, four by people. They are not very satisfactory answer, except one lady here, principal. The question is, we have failed all to convey the message to young people and particularly students that we have failed to convey not to belong to rotten society, one thing, and second, sustain the flame of discontent throughout the life and let that discontent have an initiative and creative energy, lead to creative energy. This we have failed. Um, Would somebody repeat this question? Because Harshji, if you understood yes, it. He's asking, we have failed uh, to sh show young people today the rotten society that we live in and to fail to fan the flame of discontent, which will lead to create action to create a better society in future. Uh, it's a statement, but it contains a question. Yeah. Right. Well, um, I don't know. I mean, 
I lived through the 60s in America where there's a tremendous amount of revolt and um, discontent. And we fanned the flames enough to burn several cities down. I'm not sure that we came up with any good solutions, um, but we did create cultural change. Um, I think Krishiji was more involved or more, in my understanding, more interested in learning to live in society, but not be of society. Um, he was always saying that we had to be part of society, but we, we mustn't get drawn into its values. We mustn't get drawn into its, um, its precepts. We mustn't get drawn into its biases. We, we mustn't get into its conditioning. In fact, we had to reject its values. We had to reject its, the conditioning. We had to reject all that, but we did have to live in society. Um, that's, that is my take. That is my understanding of where he was on that. And certainly, if we encourage students to ask questions, as Harsh was saying, the young people can only be discontent. They can only start refusing certain things. I don't know if that answers your question. Okay, anybody else? Yes, Harshad. I to ask. Yeah, uh, Harshadji first and then Sudeshna. Harshadji. Please mute, unmute yourself, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we talked about the presence of Krishnaji that some people would understand him even if they did not know the language or they did not hear exact words, but people were affected by the presence of Krishnaji. But uh, Krishnaji is gone, gone now. The question we should ask is <clears throat> what is the presence of teachers who work in these schools. I want to ask what is the state of the mind of teachers when they go to classroom to teach? Are they very much anxious about covering the syllabus or their mind is very, very quiet, silent, observing the student, how they behave? how to point out if students are not doing, are listening or not behaving properly. So uh, the whole thing has, uh, depends on the presence of teachers in the schools. Uh, what I find is that very, very few teachers have that kind of presence when they can really be quiet and listen and behave in such a way that students learn unconsciously by the way the teacher lives his life in relationship with people. You know. So, and the three things which Krishnaji used to talk about is about looking. How do we look when we look at a tree or to our friends, anything is our mind is really quiet to see things very, very clearly. And then uh, looking and then listening. How do we listen? While when we are listening to a student or other teachers, is our mind is really uh, very, very quiet. And third is learning because learning happens only when the mind is very, very alert and silent. And um, then learning is very enjoyable and uh, it is not a burden. So that kind of atmosphere, of course, nature is very beautiful in all the schools. 
and it affects uh, students and teachers. But the inner environment of the teacher, what is the quality of the life they live every day, day after day, that is very important to me, you know, it seems to me. And because we have not been able to make great impact on our students in the schools, it is because this thing is lacking the passion in teachers to create a new brain, not just imparting some uh, knowledge about a particular subject. Okay, I have finished. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Arthur Bhai. Uh, Sudeshna, please go ahead. Ask your question. Yes. Yes, my question is, for the last six months or so, we've been teaching online, right, with the uh, uh, students behind. So uh, the relationship between the teacher and the student is also taking a back seat, and we are pushing the students to use more and more technology. And we are asked, because of the pandemic, of course, so, sir, uh, I want to ask you, what is your take on this present pandemic, uh, education in the pandemic situation? Uh, I mean, of course, it is a temporary thing. Or should we just stop thinking about it because it is temporary? But I think another next six months also, we might have to teach online. And I can see the suffering of the students. Suffering is a wrong word to use. Maybe, you know, the, the, the staff, they cannot uh, mingle much with other students, with the teachers. And we also... The relationship between the teacher and the student, I feel, is taking a back seat. So, what is your say, and how does Black Brockwood, how is it dealing with it? I don't know. I can't speak for what Brockwood is doing because I'm not there, and I don't really know. Um, I, I really, I have followed closely though, uh, education in this pandemic. And I know that it's very, very challenging uh, to have education remotely. At the same time, um, while it's a challenge, it's also an opportunity. Um, and I think that one of the mistakes that we make is that we try and do remotely what it is that we did in person. So we, we try and have the same kind of lessons. We try and have the same uh, kind of situation, but the context is, is just too different. And I think that we have to learn how to do things differently. I don't really know what the answer to that is, but certainly we can still have some relationship with our students, even if it's remotely. It's like we can still have relationships with people, even if we can only get them on the telephone. Um, we can certainly see the work that students are doing, um, even if we can't see how they're doing it very well. So we have to make the, the best of a bad lot at the moment. And I know that some places, where students live near one another, um, they form kind of safe pods. So there might be a pod of two or three or four students who are close to one another and they're all, their families are, are careful, everyone's careful about wearing masks and all that stuff. And so they can get together and have an individual session with a teacher. Um, I don't know. I don't know what the answer is. I haven't really uh, tried to fathom it, but I know it is challenging. Thank you, Scott. I think Kumarji has a question, then Doug, Mr. Balram Bed. Yeah. Kumarji, please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I'm Kumar Ketkar. Can you hear me? Yes, I yes, can. Yes, we can. Yeah. I'm Kumar Ketkar. I'm in Delhi. And I have been, or I used to be attending Jake Krishnaji's lectures from 1967 in Mumbai at JJ School of Art uh, Ground. And uh, though you started in 72, I started in 67 when I was just 21. And uh, ever since till almost he, um, he died in 1985, I was attending his lectures except three years somewhere when I was not in Mumbai. I also went to Ohio last year and was there for the whole day. 
but that is not the question. My question is uh, that uh, the gender bias, of course, it is gender neutral to be free from conditioning and all that you explain is completely gender neutral. It applies to girls as well as boys. However, the conditioning of the girls or conditioning of uh, women or you know, female section of the society is different than the male section, different than the boys. And the conditioning of the girls within the human community is so different and so oppressive that it becomes extremely impossible for because it's a double conditioning on her, the gender conditioning as well as the social conditioning, whereas man relatively is free from that because he enjoys quote-unquote power of being a male. And therefore, it becomes very difficult to explain the ideas of uh, Krishnaji to girls, though it may be possible or it has been possible to, uh, to an extent to explain it to boys. So is it uh, possible to bridge the gap? So first of all, um, I would say that all conditioning is damaging. Um, I, I think that you would have a very hard time saying that female conditioning makes it more difficult for girls to understand Krishna G, you'd have a hard time explaining that to Pupil Jayaka or Mary Zimbalist or Mary Lechens. Um, I just don't, I don't agree with you. No, um, that's right. You know, I, I feel that we all, and in terms of the, the damage of the gender conditioning, men are as damaged as women. You don't think that they're he-men that they're going to solve answer, you know solve the problems that, that we're going we can just mansplain people we, you know it all of our conditioning our gender conditioning our race conditioning our caste conditioning our you know it's all damaging our economic conditioning you know it's all all things that we have to get rid of. And I can't say that any conditioning is good. I wish I could, I'd sign up for it. Thank you, Scott. I think we'll take uh, Mr. Balram Behra's question now. Please go ahead, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, so, uh, am I audible, sir? Yes. yes sir. <laughs> OK, yeah. Uh, it's a really, it's a blessing listen to Mr. Scott and uh, Rao, Dr. Rao and uh, you all guys, sir. I have a uh, question. Uh, the question is, uh, so far we have been uh, thinking about, we perceive the things with the five organs. But, you know, Dr. Rao has uh, cited uh, his, on his uh, way of putting a thing on listening. He has put a word like there are millions of uh, sensory nerves uh, or the organs uh, which uh, is activated or uh, which uh, perhaps uh, with uh, uh, K or F or the or some other people uh, is it possible for you to you know throw a little light on this uh, that uh, that what we perceive the things with the five organs or the, the way we think, is there some other things also involved in it? Because I was really intrigued with this word of uh, millions of sensory nerves to listen. The way, you know, K listened to you know, one on a Bombay meeting uh, that what is uh, somebody was talking long from far distance. So I want to get, you know, have you, can you throw a little light on that? Is there other uh, sensory nerves in the body or in the mind to, we should do listen other than the way we use the uh, listen or see or perceive or think or feel. Uh, uh, can you can you throw a little light on this if possible? I, I, I'm not I very don't sure know if, also I if don't know if, the right question. I don't know if I, I don't know if I can, but um, I, I would say in general, I'm not sure that we need more senses. I think we need to use the senses that we have. Um, we need to look. We don't really look. We need to listen. We don't really, we, I mean, 
We don't really listen. I don't know that we use the senses that allow compassion. I don't know that we use the senses we have. I don't know that we need more. Uh, and certainly we don't need to have more that we don't use. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Rao, is it possible, sir? Yeah, I was can going you, to say, we, we always think the mind is only here. The mind is only here, connected to the brain. I was going to say the body has so many cells. Like Krishnaji would say, let us say, what would you make out of it? Sir, listen with your heart. Listen with every part of your body. Hold Maybe some other words he used. You know, there's a gut feeling we say. What do we mean by that? The feeling of the heart and feeling of the brain, are they different? In the sense that I was only saying, mind is not just this. Listen to your whole uh, organism would mean all cells are focused. So a healthy man is he who cares for this uh, phenomenon of all the cells being engaged together to give you a healthy body. But we give so much importance to the brain and neglect the rest of us. So there is something called listening, as uh, Scott just said it. Listening is so important that just the brain is not enough, just the ear is not enough. The whole lot of the body cells can take part in it. And when, yes, sir. I agree with that. When Krishna you said if all senses operate together, there's a different kind of response from you. Just the eye, no, just not just the ear, not just the, the whole operating senses operate together without distraction. It's a different kind of listening. It looks, I, I have not done it, maybe I don't know. But there are times you have listened completely. There are times you are somewhat incomplete about listening. Something as that lady said, something takes the back seat. I also want to counter comment on that lady Sinha or this uh, yes, lady who is not here. Um, he says, the teacher takes a back seat. Can I say one small sentence about it? In fact, Krishnaji wants teachers to take a back seat also. <laughs> Not all the time be in the forefront. <laughs> so that children can work on their own. But I want to assure her, I only know about our schools, KFI and uh, whatever our school is doing and CFL. Teachers are working more hard than before to make things easy for children online. Please don't take it for granted. They are working back seat. Yes, I'm just talking on their behalf. No, no, sir. I said teacher-student relationship takes a back seat. I didn't say teacher takes a back seat. Oh, I, I see, right. Heard me wrong. All right. I said right. because we don't interact with them personally like normal times. So I said yes. teacher-student relationship. Yes, I am yes. a teacher. I know I am. We are all working hard. Thank you so much, sir. Yes. I didn't know that. Thank you. Uh, we can I ask a question to Mr. Scott. Yeah, we can take two more questions because getting late yeah. for Scott now. Uh, Mr. Raj Shekhar and Mr. Murthy, and then uh, Harshji will make an announcement. So, Mr. Raj yes. Shekhar, please, please come. Yeah. Um, thanks a lot, sir. Uh, so, this is in the context of a very interesting line that uh, uh, Scott has said when he talked about freedom is the total denial of uh, social morality and values. Uh, I mean, this is also reflective of what K used to say with regard to rejecting the society. Uh, but the way you have, uh, you know, in this particular instance, the way it is put about social morality kind of uh, um, kind of uh, recollected, I mean, help me recollect one thing that Kay used to talk about, the me that is a, and that, the... So, yeah. Excuse me for interrupting, but that was a quote yes. from Krishna Jay. Yeah, yeah, from the only revolution you told. Yeah, That's I followed right. that. Yeah, yeah. So my question is, what is the role of the I... And what is the role of the, you know, the way it divides between me and the non-me very conveniently, it keeps dividing itself. And uh, 
so is i on the side of the society or is it like a manager between the impulses and the society i'm kind of confused if you know either you or anyone else you know it could be harsh ji or gajanan ji anybody if can throw some light or anyone else actually who is participating here that will be very helpful i'm not sure i understood enough to respond to that okay uh, i will just try again so that i that we talk about which kind of very conveniently keeps uh, um, the i the me the me the I. yeah the i, the I. Yes. the way it kind of very conveniently seems to getting out of every tricky situation so what has that i got to do with the uh, society or the social morality or whatever is there so is it on the side is it siding with the society or is it uh, uh, is it just a a p phenomenon kind of a temporary phenomenon which is it a negotiating entity kind of it's that that dynamics between all of this i me society non me it's kind of seeming tricky so if anybody can throw light let me just go back to that one quote that i keep above my computer um there is no self to understand there is no i there is no me it's an entire fiction the only thing to understand is the thoughts that create the me that create the self so it's not as if there's something there that we can call i or me there's nothing there can i add something to that which which doesn't mean it doesn't cause a lot of trouble sorry harsh go on yeah well krishni has also said that this division between i me and society at large that's completely false because the if you observe the process the i is created by society everything that i am has been created over the years by all the input from society and in turn i am creating society the way i act with people what i do and all of that creates this the larger society so there is no side uh, either here of me and society it's a constant ebb and flow between what i consider myself and what i consider society it's actually two sides of the same coin dubey ji can i ask a question please uh, mr murthy i think he is in line time time is time is saying something else and okay. he is already so let i think we'll take the last question mr murthy yeah the last question and, uh, and, and then just we'll let me ask one question to start, sir <coughs> okay. okay confident okay. of that if you if we ask you to come again on this forum would you please be kind to come back again if, i mean if if you have some other if day. you have if you have something that i could contribute to um i'm good with scrambled eggs i'm you know <laughs> i'm good with picking apples off my apple tree i'm i mean i don't <laughs> I don't know what I can contribute. <laughs> Maybe I've just told you everything I know, but I'm. Uh, I think it's a it's a charming form, and thank you for thinking of inviting me again. Um, Sir, but I would have to be convinced. Some could... sort of a dialogue with Harstanka or somebody else. Yes, we can plan something you... in future. Yes, why not? Yes. yes. So you yes, can we'll take the last question. we take the last question thank you mr murthy the last question yes please word sir uh, uh good afternoon sir uh, the krishnamurthy foundation in india has come out with a publication called a seed of million years i hope uh, these are talks given by krishna ji in uh, in chennai uh, and they are very illuminating and in one of the talks he talks about a seed planted in the human mind million years ago which is struggling to take uh, germination and flower and uh, grow and he also says uh, the right kind of soil the right kind of uh, manure the right kind of uh, sunshine is not provided to the seed and so it has never grown but the seed is always there uh, 
this is very uh, difficult to understand and if you go into a little bit into the uh, hindu mythology the they talk about the third eye uh, in the center of the human brain and it is called the pineal gland the pineal gland is supposed to be a third eye and when it is awakened a lot of things happen and the science also tells us the pineal gland is a very mysterious gland and very even today the brain specialists etc have not fully understood that uh, my question is is it what uh, krishna ji is referring in his talks uh, to the pineal gland and the awakening of the third eye in the human brain i have never understood that to be the case i've never understood krishna ji was talking about that No. which doesn't mean that i understood what krishna ji was talking about or that he wasn't talking about that so i i i can't comment on that the way you can i would, i would say it is our responsibility to provide the soil not just in schools anybody it is our own responsibility for providing the right soil for the right growth and flowering if you are lucky i think we we have taken the last question i want yes. to thank yes. scott for agreeing to to be here today and to talk to us i'm sure in future we'll invite him again take time from him and it was yes. a real pleasure to hear to use this scott it was very very revealing conversation thank you so much thanks yes, a lot well, thank you for inviting thank you dubey ji thank you dubey ji thank you sir thank you Thank, Thank you, you Mr. Tanka. Scott. Can I? Can I just? Ask Tanka add? replied everything, but when I asked a direct question of a dialogue, he kept mum. <laughs> I would be very happy. I would love to talk with uh, uh, Scott then again. Then Over. request your friend. Request your friend and decide That's the date. Like tell yes. me and tell me. <laughs> just it is my work. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks Thank a lot. I Thank love you, everybody. I'm I am. I just want to say one more thing. Yeah. The hard sir yeah. is saying something. Yeah, yeah, and that is to let you all know that Rockwood Park is open. It opened on the second of September. Classes oh. are running. They are taking yeah. extreme precautions to make sure that there is no uh, coronavirus that gets into the school and regular <laughs> testing and all that. So, but it, okay. they value that close personal contact and the attention to every single student on a daily basis and working together. So. It's as absolutely essential for Brockwood that that it should be open in that way. Thank you, thank you, Good. thank, thank you, you very much. much. Thank, thank you, thank you, sir. 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 In the future. Good. It was nice seeing you again, Harsh. Nice to see you again. Yes. Oh, thank you so much, and took the trouble of staying up so late in the night to be with us today. Thank you. Thank you. I think it's way beyond your sleeping time, perhaps. Yes, it is. It's twelve. It's, <laughs> it's it's eighteen minutes past midnight. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So good 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 morning and <laughs> have a happy time. <laughs> good bed. Sweet dreams. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, all participants. Thank you. Thank you, Jansab. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Waiting for Mangalwar, Tuesday. Okay. I'm waiting for. Yeah, yeah. Sure, sure, sure. Okay. Close that. Close that. Please, Madam, close it. <laughs>